Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, it's an honor to have our distinguished guest here today. We we're just talking about how I talked about spoke with him about six months or so ago. Mm. And so we're really grateful to have him here. Um, he's, uh, he's speaking at the Literary Festival tomorrow. I don't know if we mentioned that from 1 to 2 with Randall Woods on the uh, LBJ Legacy. So if you have a chance to check that out, it's at the Dara Center. That's right downtown at the Public Library. So they're having a lot of different panels throughout the day. And then we'll do a book signing afterwards. So feel free to check him out on that. But he is uh, it's a very distinguished journalism career. He's uh, written for the Des Moines Register. And of course, he's well known for his work in the Washington Post. He has won several awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Washington Correspondence, and the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Award. Uh, he's written several books. Um, his book, Wild Blue Yonder, Money, Politics, and the B-1 Bomber, won the Olive Branch Award. And his most recent book, which was written in 2005, Judgment Days, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Martin Luther King Jr., and the Laws that Change America, is his fifth book examining American history and how public policy changed America. So he's, uh, that's, that's the book he's been talking on tomorrow with Randall Woods, who actually spoke here a while back. Um, he a grad, graduated at Dartmouth College, went to the London School of Economics, and got your uh, Master's in International Relations. Uh, do you still teach at American University? Still so good, but he taught at American University and has held a number of other posts at universities around the college. I'm sure Senator Pryor has several stories to tell you about him, but let's join in thanking Nick Hotz for being here. Well, I need to tell you how I got here. <laughs> and it has to do with uh, Mary Lynn over there and David here. Uh, I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and uh, that's part of my interest in what led to uh, this book, part of it. Uh, my grandfather, who was uh, an immigrant from the Ukraine, came to the United States as a harness maker in 1890, and he ended up in San Antonio where he ran a farm and ranch department store and eventually a ranch. His name was Callison, my <coughs> mother's father. And the Callison Ranch is about 50 miles south of the LBJ Ranch. So that's part of the, the connection. Mary Lynn and I moved to Washington in 64 where I was a Washington correspondent for the Des Moines Register and the Minneapolis Tribune. And we were at a party at a Time Magazine guy's uh, apartment. You came in 65? I came in 66. 66, okay. But we were at a party and Mary Lynn and I met Barbara and David prior and it was just the beginning of a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship. We have floated the Buffalo, have any of you all been on the Buffalo River? <laughs> we have floated the Buffalo River doing a little fishing. We used to play the Galemont Bowl at our farm in Virginia with David, Barbara, their three boys, our son, and Mary Lynn and I. Everybody played on Thanksgiving Day. Um, David is been, has encouraged both of us in so many different things. Mary Lynn and I have written nine or ten books between us, and we wrote one book together called A Passion for Equality, George Wiley and the Movement. She likes to tell the story, which is total fabrication, that uh, after writing that book together, uh, instead of getting a divorce, we went to France. <laughs> but, but anyway, ever since then, uh, this book that has both of our names on it, I have been her editor, she's been my editor. Uh, it's a volunteer job, and I like to think that if you don't like the advice you're getting, you don't have to follow it. I like to think that. <laughs> and... Uh, Mary Lynn had so much to do with this book and every other book that I've, that I've read. Um, 
went to, after I was in the Marine Corps for a couple of years and had gone to the London School of Economics, I went out to Des Moines to be a newspaper reporter. Why? I thought that I was going to be the next Ernest Hemingway, only I'd never written anything. And I knew that Hemingway had started out as a newspaper reporter. I said, well, it's simple. So I became a newspaper reporter. Um, over the years, without me uh, realizing it, somebody pointed out to me that my books and my stories and so forth, the theme of them was looking at how government works, how decisions are made. And Kent, uh, when David was at the, uh, the Kennedy Institute of Politics, the first book I wrote with Mary Lynn, she really uh, turned it into a book, was called Let Them Eat Promises, The Politics of Hunger in America. And it was about the, the tension, the theme of the book was how the government deals with farmers and subsidies not to grow food and how the government deals with poor people uh, who need to get some food from someone. And um, that book ended up being uh, required reading in, in uh, Richard Neustadt's um, introductory course at that Kennedy, the, the Kennedy program that is like your program. That really amazed me. I, people kept saying, well, I read your book. Well, he won a Pulitzer Prize. He didn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, that but book. the book, and I, I, I wasn't consciously uh, doing this, really was looking at government policy and uh, how it was made. Uh, the book that I wrote before this one called Wild Blue Yonder Money Politics and the B-1 Bomber, to which David created one, uh, contributed one of the best anecdotes in the book, and maybe he will, he will tell it to you. Uh, it involved him, a general of the Air Force, uh, his voting record in Congress, and the, which Air Force Base? At uh, Little Rock Air Force. In the Little Rock Air Force Base. And it's a wonderful story I where he stood up. <laughs> it's a great general. story. <laughs> <laughs> this was an Air Force general who um, didn't think David was doing what he should be doing for the Air Force in some of his votes. And he brought out of his coat pocket a little piece of paper and said, you know, you haven't been all that helpful to us. And he started going down this list of items. And General McCarthy? I don't know, he had a colonel with him, I believe. And, he, and I'd forgotten all, we were sitting in the office and we had a couple of staff people there. And, and uh, he says, well, how has Senator Pryor voted recently for us, for, you know, Department of Defense and Air Force. And this colonel was very uncomfortable because it was against the law to keep sheets on congressmen and senators. And, and well, uh, I don't know, we'll have to do research or something. He said, well, I thought we had a list. On that. <laughs> well, this colonel finally reached in his pocket and gave it to the general and said, oh, you, not, you don't have a very good scorecard here, Senator Pryor. And so, uh, that was when they were thinking about it. They wanted to entice me to vote for the B-1 bomber with the anticipation that it might, they might station 10 or 15 of them at the Little Rock Air Force Base. Uh, so anyway, that, the B-1 bomber. That is the politics yeah. of national defense. That story it really tells the whole thing. Because the B-1 was created out of a military, industrial, political constituency of, of, of amazing size and complexity. Um, the first chapter of the book is called The Best Bases Politics Can Afford. 
Um, one base went to Texas for Senator Tower, who was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, even though that was a terrible place to put a base. It required an additional refueling to get to the Soviet Union for Armageddon. <laughs> One base went uh, to Wichita, Kansas, where the Air Force base is almost downtown. And that was centered for Senator Dole, who was the Republican majority leader. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, a couple of words about this book, and then let's talk about whatever you, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, I got the, I'd, I'd always been fascinated with the role of Lyndon Johnson and how the 1964 and 1965 Civil Rights Acts happened. And I thought that uh, Johnson, because so much attention is always devoted to Vietnam in whatever has been written about it, that the subject of uh, Johnson's pivotal role in the passage of those two monumental civil rights bills had been neglected. Um, but you, you have to have a new angle. People say, well, why another book about civil, civil rights? Why another book about Johnson? And so I thought, I didn't know whether it was there or I could bring it off. I thought that if you took Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King together from the day of the Kennedy of the assassination of President uh, Kennedy through the day of the assassination of Martin Luther King and followed them closely with the subject first being civil rights poverty, and finally Vietnam. Uh, it would create a new prism to look at the forces that created as big a, his, a, as big a legislative breakthrough as Franklin Roosevelt's first hundred days, Woodrow Wilson's new freedoms, Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, these brief periods of time, and they really are brief in American history, when there have been huge breakthroughs, uh, really revolutionary breakthroughs. Uh, normally, if you look kind of over the long haul, uh, we are a very conservative country. We don't make big changes um, quickly or very often. So this story is essentially, the story of this book, is how Johnson and King, who on the surface appear to be very dissimilar people, um, not natural allies, but how for a brief period of time, which King called a shining moment in American history, um, they were yin and yang. They were Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. They carefully calibrated uh, their actions, what they said they didn't say. Uh, and the book looks at what created the circumstances. Think about this. In 18 months, there was the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which eliminated a hundred years of segregation in the states throughout the southern states. There was the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which finally gave uh, black Americans in the South the right to vote. But that, was, that wasn't all. There was Medicare and Medicaid. There was aid to higher education, and I bet some of you are benefiting one way or another by grants, loans, work study. Um, there was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. There were about 15 pieces of incredibly significant 
legislation that people have been talking about since Roosevelt or earlier that were passed in a period of 18 to 20 months. And I tried to examine the political dynamics that led to that change. And uh, I really enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed doing this book more than anything else. The touches of great writing in it, <laughs> Mary Lane Collins. And David read the book in uh, proof, in page proof, and it was big, big help. So I'm excited to hear about what you all are interested in and uh, whatever. Can I say a word about Mary? Please. <laughs> Mary, uh, Old Miss gave her recently, I think three years ago, the time goes so quickly, the Distinguished Alumni Award from Old Miss, University of Mississippi. Uh, she, in her own right, is a wonderful uh, writer and author and communicator. Uh, one of her early, early books was um, Upstairs at the White House. Upstairs at the White House that she wrote in cooperation with the chief usher, I guess, with, at the White House, Mary Lynn. And Mary Lynn, a product of Mississippi, having grown up in the civil rights movement, having been a part of the, the as we might say, the good guys in that movement from Mississippi, um, but still sensitive to the old traditions of, of, I guess you'd say, the South. And here comes Nick from Texas and the Iowa, was in Iowa, the, the Des Moines Register for a while, or were you just, were you the reporter for the Des Moines Register? I, I met her at her boyfriend's birthday party. Oh, no, we won't go into that. <laughs> in December. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. But anyway, she was an editor. And I was a police reporter. She was an editor at Better Homes and Gardens Better magazine. Better Homes and Gardens. Yep. Okay. And then just one career uh, opportunity after another. And their son Jack is also a very, very accomplished artist. He's one of the foremost photographers. He lives in Santa Fe. He has his own book. He's he's a he's big time. He's a big time wonderful artist with, with a camera. Say it that way. Nick and Mary have been so, I, we've been so fortunate for many, many years to know them, and they've come to Arkansas during elections for us, and as we say, we quoted the Buffalo River, and they, they, you know, they're old and dear pals. And when the book festival con, uh, concept came up, I said, oh my gosh, Nick has got to come and talk about this great contribution talking about these two giants, Martin Luther King and Lyndon B. Johnson, putting aside their differences for a while so they could get the big picture accomplished, I guess. It's the school honored to have you. And so maybe they'll ask you some questions. Now, Mary Lynn is an equal partner. I Absolutely. Guess. No, she's a senior. And the Rauschenberg, <laughs> the Rauschenberg book, one or two books on Rauschenberg. Mary. One, one book with a new edition. Well, okay. Um, and major, expanded major uh, to, book. Expanded to bring, bring it up to uh, the present time. Major book. I don't think about how we bring MLK as colleagues. Uh, are these two parallel lives that sort of bounce things off of one another? How, how, and I haven't had a chance to read your they, they, wonderful book. Colleagues would certainly not be an appropriate uh, word to describe the relationship. Silent partners <clears throat> during this critical period would be more apt. But <clears throat> King <clears throat> had a New York lawyer, black lawyer, who represented him, helped him, a guy by the name of Clarence Jones. Clarence Jones, black man, <clears throat> was married to uh, a white woman, the heiress to the Norton Publishing Company, lived in a big fancy house out in the 
out in the New York, in Westchester County. And when King was going to uh, have his first meeting with Johnson, several days after the, the, the President's, President Kennedy's assassination, it, Jones was briefing him and King was very nervous about this meeting. And he said, you know, Martin, you have more in common with Lyndon Johnson than you have with me. Clarence Jones is black, but he's this very sophisticated, suave, uh, slick New York lawyer. He says, you all both come from the Deep South. You share an abiding love for your region. Both of you made a conscious choice um, to devote your lives to this region when you could have gone anywhere. Um, culturally, there's, it's the same food, the same religion, the same songs in church. And most importantly, both Johnson and King uh, and there's a wonderful converse, telephone conversation. Have any of you all listened to the, uh, any of the LBJ telephone conversations, the tape conversations? Any, this is a wonderful tool for history and public policy. You go to the LBJ library, uh, Art of the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, and pop, 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 you can listen to the conversation I'm describing are, are any of thousands of other conversations. Um, very poignantly, King and Johnson agreed that the South would never be what it could be. This building, all these centers around here, wouldn't have happened in the 1950s or the 1960s. They both felt very strongly that until the South could get the yoke of racism out from around its neck, the South was going to be a pariah. And if they got rid of it, they got rid of segregation and legal racism uh, that the South could flourish. And uh, in, kind of in the big picture, I think that has happened in many ways. So they had, um, they had some very key common objectives. And both of them uh, were brilliant political strategists and tacticians who both instantly realized on November 22nd, before the day was over, 1963, that the assassination of the president, and you could tell before the day was over, that Kennedy was going to be an instant martyr, created an opportunity to pass these laws that the country had been talking about for 30 years. And they both went about it in the same way. King said to Kennedy on, uh, said to Johnson on the telephone, Mr. President, if you could do just one thing is to dedicate this civil rights legislation to President Kennedy's memory. And, uh, and both of them were very, very busy um, operating on the sense of national guilt. Of, um, so, and, and then the story of, of my book just traces 15, 20 key moments where Johnson and King had to understand each other, had to accommodate to each other. And through the process, they didn't love each other. Uh, Johnson, like Kennedy before him, like most uh, American elected politicians, could not stand these direct demonstrations because they were volatile. Uh, you never knew what was going to happen. They were also dangerous because the country could have been plunged in to, uh, 
into real chaos uh, as Southern authorities reacted to the demonstrations. Uh, and yet they figured out they needed each other. And um, there's just two other things. There is uh, a third actor, very, very important to this story, J. Edgar Hoover who my editor said is the Iago of this tragedy. <laughs> because Hoover, and again, you get it in the telephone conversations, the, me the, the memos. I mean, Hoover was a real dyed-in-the-wool racist and a very clever bureaucratic politician. He'd been ahead of the FBI from the day that it was created. And Hoover is whispering in Johnson's ear poison about King. Johnson totally ignores it, except, except to tell bawdy stories after work when they're sitting drinking scotch in the quarters. He totally ignores it uh, because he needs King. And if King gets destroyed, uh, because of accusations of communist AIDS or because he was a profligate uh, adulterer. The whole movement gets destroyed. Finally, when they split over Vietnam in 1967, Johnson <coughs> then began to use the poison in sort of indirect ways. And uh, four days before King was killed, Johnson announced he would not run for re-election. And I say that, that King, when he died and became an instant martyr, uh, was a pretty well broken man. He had been supplanted by um, the young black power advocates, Stokely Carmichael uh, and others. And, Johnson, and both Johnson and King, the tragedy was the dream that they shared in common of going the next step to attack poverty and so forth uh, was destroyed by Vietnam. That's a long-winded answer about whether they had something in common. I'll try to be briefer. Yeah. I grew up in the hill country of Texas. And, um I've always thought that, um, that Johnson had every right to be a Strom Thurmond or a George Wallace because that's the culture that he grew up in. But he didn't. And I've always wondered, well, I mean, he, he was a teacher, but what was it about his, his own self that he was able to go against the trend of his own self? I mean, he was the only one... Or how many didn't sign the Southern Manifesto? There were, th there were three people that didn't, three senators. So was there and all of them wanted to be president. Lyndon Johnson, Gore Sr., and Estes Kefauver, the two senators from Tennessee. They were the only three Southern. of the 24, 26 Southerners that didn't sign it. That's, I mean, what made him such a radical? Well, um, no. you all really ought to read Randall Woods' biography of Johnson. It is brilliant about the early influences on Johnson. And, uh, you know, just very fast to tick off a number of things. First of all, Johnson's father and his grandfather were both one-term members of the Texas State Legislature. They were populists, they were agrarian populists, and both of them fought the Klan, fought the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so in his background, and uh, further back in his background, grandfather, or great-grandfather Baines had been Sam Houston's preacher. Uh, so Johnson had a history uh, that, that was very progressive in his background. That's number one. When he got to be a member of Congress, he was one of three or four Southern members of the House of Representatives who voted for the minimum wage, the creation of the minimum wage, 
the creation of Social Security. He was a liberal and a populist. When Johnson ran for the Senate, and now he had to run in the whole state, um, he became far more conservative uh, because he wanted to win in the whole state. But the liberal uh, roots and impulses were there. And there's an amazing conversation that goes on in the wee hours of the late night on November 22nd, 63, on into November 23rd, where Johnson is sitting around with Bill Moyers, Jack Bellany, and uh, one other aide by the name of Cliff Carter, and is talking about what he wants to do. And he's been president, you know, 12 hours. He knows what he wants to do. Uh, because he's now a free man. So uh, Randall and I, now Johnson is also a pragmatist uh, and, and he can be tough and mean as hell. Um, and, he, and there are always political motives involved. But you can make Johnson into anything you want to make him by what you pick out uh, now, uh, Goodman, Doris Kearns Goodman, who helped Johnson write his horrible memoir, which was written by a committee, he told uh, Goodwin a story, which is also part of the truth. He said, when I became president, I was going to face a Democratic convention in seven, eight months, and the liberals controlled the Democratic Party. And if I didn't get on board to push these liberal causes, I would have been dead in the water before I started. That's also a political reality. Uh, but the thing that convinces me about Johnson, you hear in these telephone conversations. I mean, they're incredible. The 64 Democratic Convention, where uh, the blacks from Mississippi were trying to get in because they had been kept out of the party uh, primaries, they'd been you know, kept out of being delegates, and Johnson was scared to death the whole South was going to walk out. And, uh, and he, Johnson was also paranoid. Um, and he became, I mean, really paranoid when the war and everything closed in on him. He was horrible what he did at, before that convention started, and I lay it out in the book. There were 30-some-odd FBI agents there spying on this group of blacks and their white allies. So it's just about over, and they've worked out a compromise. And John Connolly, the governor of Texas, and Governor Sanders of Georgia, the great white hope moderate, get Johnson on the phone and say, you've given the whole damn thing away to the niggers and Martin Luther King. And then you got to hear his voice, what he's telling them. They deserve to be there. You guys, we have to stop beating up on these people. We have to let them eat. We have to let them. His passion comes through again and again. And to my ears, this is him talking from the gut and from the heart. Well, there's got to be. I mean, we can't solve these big problems. When Senator Pryor was in the Senate, and maybe you'll 
address this, uh, David. There were 15 or so uh, Democrats and Republicans who who you could call moderates. I mean, those terms are meaningless. And in the period of a couple of years, or maybe six years, all of you were gone. D among the Republicans, Danforth, Cohen, Baker, uh, Kassenbaum, Packwood, Packwood, and w wasn't it something about the the atmosphere? becoming very different. And you could feel the change about about that time. I, also I think a lot more than just issues, I think the money in politics is changing, has changed the disability quotient. And gosh, look at what look at what, what Hillary and Obama and Julia, look at look at the amount of money they're right. Look at the time they're expending. Uh, I, I'll hate to admit it, my son today is in Detroit, Michigan. What's he doing in Detroit, Michigan? He's raising money. Last week he was in Boston, he was in South Carolina, North Carolina, raising money. I mean that I think that in itself is doing a great deal to the lack of civility and to the moderate voices in the, in the House and Senate. Johnson is uh, usually characterized by what was part of his persona and style as the arm twister. Um, Hubert Humphrey described something that, uh, just one, one part of this, Humphrey, uh, called it the nostril inspection. Johnson towered over, Johnson was six feet four, he towered over these guys, and he put his arms, his hands on their shoulders and started kneading their shoulders. And Humphrey thought, he's looking right down my nostrils. You know, he's looking up, and Johnson's peering into his nostrils. But listening to dozens, hundreds of these conversations, far more often the way Johnson got the votes, and this is going to your point of people cooperating, was he appealed to the highest and best instincts of every man, and, uh, and successfully. Uh, Everett Dirksen, who was a Republican leader, highly partisan, tough, uh, conservative politician. But Johnson appealed to his sense of patriotism, his sense of history, uh, you know, our common needs to get Dirksen to be a leader uh, on issue after issue. And, and he wasn't above saying, Everett, after this bill is passed, you know, there's a statue of Lincoln there on the Capitol grounds in Springfield. There will be a statue of Everett Dirksen beside Lincoln, even if I have to build it myself. Um, so he, we desperately need that. We all know that. Um, how, are we, how are we ever going to get out of uh, Iraq without that kind of cooperation. Yes? I got a question. You, you said that he didn't like the grassroots protests that were going on, the civil rights movement, the freedom riders, the French conversations. Um, but how effective was that at bringing it to the political forefront and making it a tipping point? Well, I argue in this book that none of this would have happened without the constant pressure of the movement over a period of three or four years. And it manifests itself so obviously before your eyes that you have to have scales over your eyes not to see it. Uh, Birmingham in 1963, uh, John F. Kennedy had done nothing on this civil rights legislation. 
and we're in June of 63, so he's been president for two and a half years. He had done nothing. And then came uh, the uh, Birmingham, the police dogs leaping out at kids' throats, the fire hoses bowling them over. And Kennedy started to move. But what we don't read about is that the demonstrations in Birmingham in a matter of 48 hours spread to other cities all over the United States. Um, and same thing happened in 65. Again, this time it was the Voting Rights Act. Uh, when there was Bloody Sunday on the Edward, Edmund Pettus Bridge where these peaceful marchers uh, were run over by um, vigilantes from the sheriff's office, the state police, and so forth. Um, what we don't think about is once again, that spread all over the United States. In Detroit, one or two days after the Bloody Sunday, uh, the governor of Michigan, George Romney, the mayor a Republican, the mayor of Detroit, a guy named Kavanaugh, led a huge protest march together around the federal building in uh, Detroit, calling for the passage of the laws. And I argue in this book, nothing would have happened without the relentless pressure. And of course, the uh, King was so, uh, he was both very high-minded and very clever in creating the kind of crisis situation and bringing it to a boil where the worst instincts of these Southern politicians and law enforcement officers would be put into play. So what we saw on our television screens was peaceful, nonviolent demonstrators asking for the most basic rights being brutalized by law enforcement officers. Um, anyway, I, I couldn't say more strongly. Now, if it was just the demonstrators, um, we could have those kind of demonstrations today, but if the Congress behaved the way it's behaving right now, I'm not sure it would make any difference. But great leaders, I think, seize opportunities. And Johnson saw the opportunity. King did. Uh, and the public responded. Uh, after Selma, a Gallup poll maybe a week later, we're talking about the spring, March of 1965, showed 85 to 90 percent of the American public was in favor of a voting rights law, and a majority of white Southerners were in favor of a voting rights law. So that was the power of those demonstrations to galvanize public opinion. And the power of television. Yeah. And the power of television, absolutely. Excuse me, to avoid. Yeah, a way to avoid martyrdom. Martyr. 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 To, to achieve the same effect? Yeah, and, avoid, and also avoid martyrdom. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. In other words, can we do the right thing without having blood in the streets? I hope so. What are you all, you're, you're getting a, a master's degree in, is it called public service? Why are you interested in getting that degree? What, uh, what motivates you? What do you want to do after you get the degree? Why are you here? 
<laughs> because that's, that's part of the answer to what we're talking about, I think. speeches. I mean, you know, right yeah. up. State right, of the Union? No. January this was, um, you know where Catula is? Mm -hmm. Catula is, is a very, very poor Hispanic community somewhere in the hill country. But this is the speech um, it was, at, it was the climactic moment of the voting rights fight. And Johnson went before a joint session of Congress and did something that no American president had ever done. It was a great speech in many ways. But at some point in that speech, he said um, that we've got many things that we have to overcome in this country and problems and so forth. And then with those long ears, and he, he looked terrible on, didn't know how to use television. He peered out at America and said, and we shall overcome. With that phrase, he adopted the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement. But there is a wonderful couple of lines in that speech. Let me, let me just see somebody else talk here. Let me see if I can find <laughs> Catula, because I'd like to read that to you. If well, I um, one of the things that when I was doing this recent research was to find out, to figure out, and maybe you already know this, Keith, but um, the Catula Institute is based in Boston, Massachusetts. The federal government did not aid K-12 education. They had the GI Bill, but he wrote grants for the federal government through Title I, and he sought to, to, to do 
to K through 12. For them, it was to, we're totally at the mercy of the property tax of where you were, where you live, much less than this now. And there was no federal aid for that. So that's pretty that historic. And but it's being took away, I think it's being backed out. That ESEA was the no child left behind law is now. That's the 2002 authorization of the ESEA. Johnson started this this speech, and uh, Doris Kern Goodwin's husband, Richard Goodwin, who was an aide first to Kennedy and then to Johnson, wrote the speech. But Goodwin says, and he's right, says this is this is Lyndon Johnson. This was me studying Lyndon Johnson. He starts out, he says, at times history and fate meet in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. And so it was last week in Selma, Alabama. Now, Catula. Um, Johnson starts talking about uh, his growing up in the Hill Country. Johnson went to San Marcos State Teachers College, which is now Texas State University at San Marcos with 23,000 students. Then it was a broken down little teacher's college, and he had an inferiority complex for the rest of his life about the Harvards even though he was smarter than most of them. Um, okay. Where is it? Where is it? Now, you all are all supposed to have copies of this book. <laughs> so you can help me here. Um, Let me show you something about Nick Cox and his research methods. <laughs> six years of our lives. And um, it, what he is telling you today is not even the, 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 the tip of the iceberg, it's the tip of the tip of the tip. Because it makes particular ability to take an issue. Nick is, he did not come to this project with a thesis. Nick is an investigative reporter, and as I have often said, journalism is a continuing education mm -hmm. uh, because we ask questions for a living. And Nick first started by interviewing the survivors. He had, of course, he had read uh, the great, the, he had a, a huge bibliography of, of Johnson books and King books, and he had read those. And he started in order to make an outline for the book. Then he he interviewed uh, the people. Well, what is it about Johnson? What what did he say? And then the tapes, boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of the tapes. And going through the tapes that some of which were not cataloged and as to the what parts of the context so it had to be to go through the tapes and find dates that approximated uh, legislative or, or demonstrated. Did you find I it? Found it. Okay. <laughs> I found it. But okay. The, I found it. Okay. Please, please, right please. It's going through Nick's particular um, I think a, a, a grand, a grand. I would, I wouldn't say touch of genius, but his particular genius in these books that examine public policy through human interaction is that he assembles in his research. I mean, masses and masses and masses and masses of, of you know, perhaps three or four dissertations full of material, and he finds the spine of the story that 
makes the the human contribution and he finds who and what powers they have and what abilities they had and how they worked with other people. And so having this ability I think is is quite an amazing thing that he can he without a thesis go into the material and find the connective thread, the spine that ties this material together and makes it a story. And and another thing in being an investigative reporter is that he is somehow able to find the um, the bureaucrat and, and government agencies who think something is wrong and the brave quiet bureaucrat who will finally unlock a door in the FBI or in the, the Johnson library or in Mr. Nixon's mm -hmm. income tax mm -hmm. uh, backdating his, his uh, issue. It, he has the ability to find somebody in whatever agency there might be to open a door to get all of these FBI tapes. Well, I, Mary Lynn's much too kind. Thank you, thank you. I'll pay you later. From the first, from the first day I went on the police beat in Des Moines, uh, I loved it. I, I love it. And I love it to this day. Anyway, here's his speech. Uh, what town were you from? Um, other than Junction, Creek Springs, and um, uh, my mother was from San Marcos. Right. Land, right. Land, little, little Some of the best barbecue in the world, even better than Arkansas barbecue. Wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, oh. We all have a barbecue off. I'll challenge any Arkansas. Ar well, if David doesn't get me some barbecue while we're here, I can remember when we were in Hot Springs the on bars. a trip, and we, but we went in your boat up to one place. Yeah, I that. Didn't they sell us the barbecue? Yeah. Here, here's Johnson. <laughs> Johnson borrowed the money from a banker. He borrowed $100 to send him to this jerk water college. And when you're getting a degree in education, you have to go out and do practice teaching, right? Mm -hmm. So Johnson was sent to Catula. He says, my first job after college was as a teacher in Catula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of the students could speak English. My children were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. They knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them, but they knew it was so because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home after the classes were finished wishing there was more that I could do, but all I knew was to teach them the little that I knew, hoping that it might help them against the hardships that lay, a, lay ahead. Somehow you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. I never thought then in 1928 that I would be standing here in 1965. It never occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over the United States. Johnson paused and again one heard the big Texans speak. Think of the ears, the nose, but also the voice because he was very powerful. But now I do have that chance, and I'll let you in on a little secret. I mean to use it. <laughs> I believe that that is, that that's not just political rhetoric. Well, I think 
think that's about time. Well, one, one more little quick story here. I, I've got to tell one more. You know little, I know y'all are tired. Um, yeah, they've been all day in a classroom, Nick, but this has just been wonderful and thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to what I hope may be a next book. And I hope it will be a collaborative effort. I hope it will be a book on J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. It may or may not be, but I've always thought that that is rich area for mining with your ability as an investigator. Wouldn't that be something? But I've always heard a wonderful story about LBJ and Everett Dirksen. Dirksen heading up the Republicans, LBJ the Democrats. They finally got the votes for the Civil Rights Bill in 65, I guess the first one. And what, L, what Everett Dirksen really wanted from his friend and competitor and adversary, LBJ on the other side of the aisle, what he wanted more than anything else than the statue next to Abraham Lincoln Everett Dirksen wanted something that Lyndon Johnson had. He wanted a telephone in his limousine. Lyndon Johnson had a telephone in his limousine. And there weren't car telephones during that time, but LBJ had a phone. And so Everett kept saying to Lyndon Johnson, gosh, if I get those votes, will you, can I get me a, you're heading up to, you know, you." pull all the power switches and levers around this town in the capital to be the Democratic leader. Is there a way I could get a telephone in my limousine? <laughs> and Lyndon Johnson said, Ev, if you get me those votes, you'll never know what, he didn't say yes or no, but if you get those votes, you just never know what. Well, the afternoon that the roll call was cast and announced, LBJ went down, got in his limousine, drove off. Everett Dirksen got in his limousine with his chauffeur, and he drove off. And the driver said, Senator Dirksen, you've got a surprise. He looked down, and there was a car telephone. <laughs> and he said, here's the instruction, Senator Dirksen, and you need to call Lyndon Johnson and thank him. <laughs> and so he, Everett Dirksen picked up the phone and dials or talked to the operator. LBJ picks up the phone in his limousine across town by now. And um, Everett Dirksen says, Lyndon, I just want to thank you for my phone. Hold on just a minute, Everett. My other phone is ringing. <laughs> <laughs> now, whether or not, whether or not uh, that was true or not, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.